Good afternoon. Welcome to, welcome to RISE. Uh, this is the kickoff for the annual RISE conference, and welcome to the Center for Global Development. Uh, my name is Justin Sandifer. I'm a senior fellow here at CGD and somehow implicated in the RISE business here. Um, appreciate you coming out uh, on a hot, hot afternoon uh, for what I think will be an exciting and possibly contentious opening panel here for the RISE conference on public-private partnerships in education in the developing world. Um, so a little bit of intro and background before I uh, introduce our panel here. Um, one of the kind of key motivating kind of facts about the world uh, behind RISE is this idea of a learning crisis. It's UNESCO's term, you know, that school enrollments around the world are booming, but literacy and numeracy levels, you know, are kind of woefully falling behind. And this lear learning crisis is kind of the real kind of focus of the RISE program. Um, there's another uncomfortable fact, which is less central to the RISE program, but it's kind of central to the discussion tonight, which is that in many places, not all places, but in many places, those learning levels are much higher in private operated schools than they are in government schools. There's a public-private kind of learning differential. Um, like I said, an uncomfortable fact. Um, and, you know, kind of a naive reaction would be, uh, well, fine, we have private delivery of uh, education services, we can add public money to the mix in a public-private uh, partnership, get the private sector efficiency, get the equity advantages of the public sector, and, you know, it's a win-win situation. Um, there are real outstanding questions there about whether governments in the real world who struggle to run public school systems well can design and operate effective public-private partnerships as well. Uh, and so this evening, this afternoon, we've got three people with interesting and unique perspectives on that topic of the viability uh, and the success to date of these kinds of public-private partnerships uh, in education. Uh, so starting immediately to my right um, is Susanna Harris, who is Executive Director of ARC's Education Partnership Group. And I'm going to let Susanna in a few minutes explain a little bit more uh, what ARC is and what ARC does. Uh, and then to her right, uh, we have Jishnu Das, who is a lead economist at the Development Research Group at the World Bank, uh, and has done years of work, among other things, on low-cost private schools uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and then at my far end, we have Jim Emery, who is head for strategy uh, of manufacturing, agribusiness, and services at the International Finance Corporation, IFC. So Jim, thank you for being with us uh, here this afternoon as well. Uh, look forward to... Um, an interesting conversation here. So I have subjected our panelists to sort of an experimental format, um, and they have all been um, good sports about this, which is that I forbid them from having slides. We're not going to have mini speeches and presentations, but there will be a few visuals as we move along. Um, but I am in control. I have monopoly power uh, over the clicker here. Um, so I'm going to, you know, we'll start off with a discussion here. Uh, for about 45 minutes or so with the panelists, with some visuals to stimulate us, and then we'll open it up for all of your uh, questions down the line. Um, okay, so let me start actually. Um, can we get this screen to work as well? In the meantime, while we're working on that, I'm going to start with you, Jishnu. Not in order of seating here. Um, so behind, before we get into public-private partnerships per se, I think we need a little bit of background on this phenomenon of the rise of private schooling in the developing world. And you've been tracking a set of students for a decade or more now in Pakistan. Um, a couple of these are graphs from a paper you wrote almost a decade ago. Um, this idea of a dime a day really putting forward this idea that these low-cost private schools are that, are low-cost. So tell us a bit about the phenomenon, and what are parents getting? What are they responding to? What's going on here? Uh, so sure. Uh, so first of all, I'm not Karthik Murlidharan, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything uh, I... This was the... Uh, I, 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 the I, let, me, I'm let, a, let me interrupt you again to say, and with deep apologies, for those of you who want to walk out because Jishnu is not Karthik... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this Karthik is the is, opportunity. I think he's in the hospital with his wife at the moment, who is pregnant, and apologizes. Uh, 
that he can't be here with us this evening. I, if there was any other excuse, I would have harassed him, but given the situation. Yeah. Just, just new, please. But everything I say and do should be attributed to Karthik, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been having this fight for a while. Uh, so these are just private schools by year of formation in, in Pakistan, and in 1987, there were about 3,000 of them. By 2005, there were about 47,000. Uh, by 2011, there are about 55,000 or so, right? So, you know, what are the schools that typically about 100 kids? They've been really coming up in rural areas. So, you know, the growth is kind of stalled at about 50% in urban areas. In rural areas, they're just growing rapidly. Uh, there are about 100 kids. There are about seven to eight teachers. Uh, right now, they're, you know, the fees are about $2 a month maybe on an, in an average uh, private school. Uh, and they're really all over, right? I mean, so the, the, the issue which, when we started working on this in 2003 was, you know, these guys are fly-by-night operators, they're deceiving parents, they're, you know, producing very poor quality. And that actually turns out not to be the case. So the, the graph on the right is just, what's the size of learning gaps in private versus public schools? And the obvious question that, that you'll have is, well, these are just smarter kids. Uh, so there are some other gaps in there showing household characteristics like rich or poor families or literate or illiterate moms. And the size of the private public uh, gap is just orders of magnitude higher. Uh, you still want to worry about, you know, what about unobserved selection? There's a bunch of careful work that we've done, that others have done. And these typically show that these, when you know, once you control for selection in various different ways, kind of depends on the setting you're in. But the private schools are never doing worse on any subject than the public schools, and they're often doing better on one or more subject over that time. So, you know, this is not just a Pakistan phenomenon. So the latest estimates we have uh, are that about 30% of primary school going children are in private schools. Uh, 30% worldwide. worldwide. So in, in low and middle income countries. And in Pakistan and India, that means about 40 to 50 million children in the primary age groups uh, are studying in these kind of low cost, you know, private schools today, of which I would say about 80% are in these low cost private schools. And how much of this, I mean, the line is shooting up. This is surely faster than population growth. Is this continuing? How much is this outpacing the growth of enrollment as a whole? Can you put this in perspective? So I think it's started to stabilize now. So we haven't seen sharp increases. We've seen, in, you know, enrollment increases in Pakistan happen till about, you know, 2013, 2014. And since then it's stabilized, it's slowed down a little bit. So it's at about 40, 45% now of, of uh, all, for all enrollments, and my guess is it'll, you know, it's it's not going to rise dramatically beyond that, is my sense. Okay. And on the right-hand side, I mean, you said, I mean, th these gaps are enormous, right? These learning gaps mm -hmm. between the public and private sector are several times greater than the learning gaps between rich and poor households. Mm -hmm. As you said, you know, some of that is robust to trying to control for the selection. Give us a rough estimate. How much of this gap do you think, you know, is an actual causal effect here? So we're finding, I mean, I, I think they're very different results depending on where you look. So uh, Karthik has some, Karthik has some fantastic work uh, <laughs> from uh, Andhra Pradesh using a, a voucher and in the voucher he finds uh, impacts on the local, on, on English, but not on the local language or on, on uh, depending on what kind of, you know, what, what in the, the medium of instruction was. Uh, Abhijit Singh also has some work from the state in India called Andhra Pradesh where they find different effects across urban and rural. In Pakistan, we are finding very, very large effects, right? So uh, on our test, these effects carried out over eight years of schooling uh, are turning out to be about one standard deviation, which in years of learning tells you that over eight years of learning, you're probably about two years, you're getting an additional two years if you're going to private schools. Okay, so just to prod you a little bit, my kind of prima facie case here to say that parents are voting with their feet. There's a huge emergence of this low-cost private sector, huge learning differentials. Is this not a prima facie case for investment in this sector if, if we're interested in raising learning levels? Yeah. I mean, there's also an increase in good restaurants in D.C. 
<laughs> you know, I'm not sure that's a good case for public subsidies into uh, good restaurants in DC. I mean, I, I think we just had a really hard time saying things are working well for us. The next step of that is therefore we should step in. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a fine policy judgment to say, leave it alone. Right? So, so we make a very clear distinction between private schooling and private schools. And our idea has been, you know, we can go into that later. I'm going to push you but, more on that later. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I don't think, you know, my one-liner on this, you know, in India we say that the private sector is exactly as efficient in the, as the public sector in direct proportion to the subsidy it receives. So, you know, I want to keep that in mind, right? <laughs> All right, um, let me stop you there and, and move over to Susanna, um, who is not happy to leave well enough alone uh, with the private sector. Um, so among the many things that ARC does, uh, ARC runs, I know that British Academy operators don't like this comparison, but something akin to American charter schools in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then your team does work uh, on policy advice in the developing world. Tell us a bit more about what ARC does, where, why, and so on. Mm -hmm. So Justin is right, in the UK we run a network of academy schools which aren't quite like charter schools but similar enough for Americans to make um, sort of broad comparisons like that. Um, outside of the UK we don't run schools, we partner with governments to support them to improve their education systems. Um, we work across a number of areas there, so we look at accountability issues quite broadly, but we're probably best known for our work on public-private public -private partnerships. Um, so we don't support governments to design and implement public-private partnerships because we think the private sector is better. We do it for sort of two quite pragmatic reasons. So firstly, the one that Jishnu referred to, that 30% of kids globally are in private schools, and we think that particularly in poor countries where enrollment is very high, the government does have this sort of duty to ensure that every child um, receives a quality education, no matter whether that's the public sector or the private sector providing it. Um, and secondly, so as Justin said, we are in a learning crisis um, and governments the world over are looking for um, interesting solutions to help try to raise the quality of, um, of outcomes. Um, so we really position ourselves on the government side of the equation in PPP, sort of saying that People often think about PPPs on the private side, but actually the public P is just as important, if not more important, as the private P. Um, it's not an easy solution. It's not an outsourcing for governments. They need the capacity to sort of finance, commission, regulate, hold accountable any private operator that they do that they do engage with. Um, so a couple of examples of what we're actually doing. Um, we're working with the government of the Western Cape in South Africa. Um, to implement a public-private partnership called Collaboration Schools. Um, that's really a sort of public sector PPP, if you like, so more on the public side, where sort of um, government schools are partnered with private nonprofit organizations um, to try to improve the quality of, of outcomes there. So these are no-fee, um, largely non-selective schools, which at the moment the teachers remain on government contracts until sort of attrition happens, they then move on to private contracts. Um, teachers can remain unionized. Um, it really is sort of quite a public PPP, as is the UK Academy program. I guess on the other hand, on the other side of the spectrum, we're working with the government of Uganda, um, <coughs> who've been really sort of pioneering in this PPP space. So they launched a PPP before most of us knew what one was um, back in sort of the early 2000s really to look at how they could improve access to um, secondary education. I think at that time only about 25% of kids were transitioning from, pri from primary to secondary school. Um, and they essentially implemented a program to provide subsidies to private schools to enable them to allow kids to access secondary education who weren't able to pay. Um, and they've been really successful in terms of the access objective there. I think about 450,000 kids are now in secondary school because of that program. Um, but they've also recognized that they probably could do some things to improve sort of quality and equity issues. And so we're actually supporting them now to think about what changes they might make to that program going forwards. Um, and I think I'll talk about another couple of examples later on. Which brings us to the busiest slide of the night. Um, just to push you a little bit more on this this notion you mentioned in there, and I really didn't realize you were going to bring it up so soon, but that there's sort of this spectrum between very public, public-private partnerships and very private, public-private partnerships. Um, so I saw you present this slide, I think, at 
CIAS conference in Atlanta, um, we, I started off talking about a public-private partnership as injecting public finance into privately operated schools. Um, there's clearly more dimensions to this problem than just who provides the finance and who runs the schools. And you've listed a number here. So walk us through who is on either end of this spectrum and why. What do you think are the key dimensions here? So it's quite hard to talk about this slide without sort of jumping up and um, dancing around it, but I'll try. So really, I mean... You're what, free to do that. If you like. <laughs> and what this is trying to show is that, I mean, first of all, there's no one single thing as a PPP. There's sort of a really broad range from those PPPs that really are on the public side to the ones that sort of are very much on the private sector side. And what I mean by that is to take an example of Partnership Schools for Liberia, which really has, as many of you all know, attracted a lot of attention um, because it's a supposedly a private sector PPP, it's really very, very public. Um, so partnership schools for Liberia are non-selective schools where teachers are on government contracts, they remain unionized, it's non-selective, no fee, um, government buildings. I mean, there's sort of very, very limited autonomy for the private operators under that initiative. And you sort of go down to the other end of the spectrum and look at something like the Uganda Universal Secondary Education Program, which is subsidies to private schools. And then that program, you know, these are private buildings run by private operators where the government's paying the private sector organization to deliver education. And so you'll see the sort of crosses there where the sort of far more um, sort of similarities with the Ugandan public system. Um, and I think you could also draw a line between sort of the US charters and the Pakistan vouchers to say, these really are kind of public schools with private organizations being brought in to make them better. Whereas on this side of the table, it's sort of private schools with government finance injected into them. And the right hand side, you can probably see some sort of quite serious differences, significant differences between the cost of education between public and private schools. Because it's this side where you get the teachers on private contracts generally being paid a fraction of what they might be paid in government schools. On this side, you generally, not always, but generally have the teachers remaining on public sector contracts with the benefits and the remuneration that that in, involves. Um, and therefore, you're probably not achieving sort of um, huge efficiency gains, quote unquote, through teacher salaries. Um, can I stop there? Uh, right after you tell us which of these is the optimal choice uh, of design features. Uh, I mean, so I'll use that sort of as a plug to say that I think it's very difficult to actually say which of these is the optimal design, because we just don't have enough evidence about their impact. Um, so I think we're, you're probably going to ask me about the rigorous review that ARC has commissioned. Um, it's looking at different types of PPPs um, and sort of what the evidence is about their success. And I think sort of the main message that you could take from all of these programs, probably with the, the exception of the UK academies and US charters, is there just isn't enough. Um, I think you probably can say that those programs where there's very, very limited government intervention, I think governments feel they're not necessarily getting good value for money from those programs. So potentially they're sort of seeing that they're not sort of, these aren't seen as public sector programs where the government's actually seen as providing a service to its citizens. Um, but no sort of clear optimal design. We'll, we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll come, come back, back to the that. evidence base. Um, Okay, let me turn actually over to Jim uh, from the IFC. Um, so, I mean, I think for you're going to have a mix of people in the audience. I have a feeling, how many World Bankers do we have in the audience? Yeah. Oh, a handful, you know. <laughs> There's going to be a range of familiarity with the structure of the World Bank Group and what the IFC does. Uh, so maybe, so I was, you know, I went onto the IFC webpage and looked under the education tab um, and the kind of the mission statement priorities there was that we help Private education companies expand to reach more students in middle and low income groups and to promote a higher quality of education. But uh, give us a bit more of a kind of tour of the waterfront. What do you folks do and what's the theory behind it? Okay. Thanks, Justin. Well, I should say, first of all, that with, as with just new, I'm not Sergio Pimenta, who was originally <laughs> billed to be here with you. Um, uh, he's the director of the Department of Mass that, in, in IFC that deals with uh, education. Uh, and I also work with him in that group. Um, so IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Um, so we invest in and support uh, and enable private investment in emerging markets. 
to support uh, growth and development. You can, you can tell that because I'm here wearing a suit and tie. Jishnu from the World Bank here is looking <laughs> much more relaxed and, and casual. Um, so in education, I think that... I'll take that as a compliment. You should be, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think we all can probably agree that the, the backbone of a good education is, uh, educational system is almost always a very strong public sector educational system that ensures access to all um, and kind of a level playing field, openness, and adequately resourcing um, the education sector and providing standards and, and all of those things. Um, we see the private sector role as really operating to fill gaps where the public sector, for whatever reason, is unable to meet the demand or is unable to um, uh, put in place the resources of the institutions that can deliver quality education. Um, so we look to support private sector models that are that can achieve scale, that are replicable, that can be deployed to actually lower costs and increase efficiency. We look to the private sector in particular to support innovation in education provision um, and to, in general, work where public sector is, is faltering. Um, Together as the World Bank Group, we provide a lot of support to the education sector. The World Bank uh, financed $46 billion from in the last 15 years for education. IFC is a much smaller piece of that. We have an investment portfolio of about $700 million now. We did about uh, anywhere from $150 to $200 million per year in education investments. Can I? interrupt you just to add that I went on your website, okay. took it straight off your website. So these numbers, we haven't seen any dramatic, I think the numbers you just mentioned, they're the IFC's portfolio in education. Is that? Yeah, so that. Orders of magnitude, we're still roughly right here. Yeah, we're still, we're still there. And the breakdown as you have it is, uh, we've got it characterized a bit differently mm -hmm. um, as about 75% in tertiary education. Mm -hmm. Uh, about 20% in educational systems, teacher training, support systems, and educational technology. Uh, and then the 5 or 10% that's left is primary and secondary education. Mm -hmm. So the big focus for us has been tertiary. That's where we've seen the biggest expansion in demand, um, particularly in middle-income countries, and a public sector simply unable to add capacity to serve that. So in countries like Brazil, we've seen a tremendous uh, expansion in the private university system that has largely been the engine that's provided access to that whole growing middle class who now want university-level education or technical-level education very closely linked to skills and employability in the job market. Um, the, we support both for-profit and not-for-profit private institutions directly. We have a sort of mixed portfolio of both. I think we see advantages in, in both business models. Some of our, one of our best uh, uh, client institutions is a, is a nonprofit Jesuit university in Latin America, and they've done a tremendous job at uh, expanding. Um, so, so, so tell me a bit more then. So you, you potentially could be a for-profit or a nonprofit organization you're investing in, but how are those portfolio choice decisions made? How are those investment decisions made? Especially, it's one thing to say in the mining sector, you're looking for profitable investment opportunities. In the education sector, what kind of calculus goes into choosing those? Yeah, it's a, it's a different calculus for us in, in education and, and also in health. I think what we look for is, um, you know, what is the current education system in the country? What are the private institutions that are contributing to that? And what are the ones with potential to grow and reach scale and expand access? Um, and we look to, to really those metrics for the impact of the investment uh, and not on its contribution directly to, to, uh, you know, to growth or employment or any of those metrics. We, we look at it completely differently than we would a manufacturing or agribusiness or financial sector investment. So to hold your feet to the fire a little bit, does that mean, well, what would that mean in practice? What, what kinds of metrics that would mean potential to enroll? Would you be looking at the kinds of learning gains Jishni was talking about a minute ago? What kinds of things would 
would be because as we as you just got done saying, I mean, in the mining sector, commercial impact is kind of easier to quantify. In the social sector, is presumably there's more than just yeah. that financial. Well, return. I think what we're looking for are institutions that have growth potential and that need capital to fund that growth. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that typically means the main metric that we look at is growth in student enrollments, mm -hmm. but we also look at the the income level segments that they're serving. Um, we're trying to get uh, uh, you know, more access to lower income population segments, uh, but there's also contributions that private inst educational institutions make um, you know, that are for more full fee paying, higher end uh, uh, professional and other uh, types of universities that, uh, uh, that are really are reaching upper and middle income segments as well. So it's a kind of across that whole uh, range, and we're looking at really the kind of institutions that are uh, that can increase their contribution to the educational system, that are growing, and that that need capital in order to do so. I want to say something that's maybe just painfully obvious, but tell me if I'm wrong. Most of the conversation around public-private partnerships is around, as I keep saying, the injection of public finance to to subsidize or make education free from the point of view of the user. And the subsidies the IFC provides are on the supplier end, correct? I mean, it could be that some of your, some of the universities that you invest in are enrolling students who are receiving scholarships or grants through the government. It could be that these are fee paying. The IFC doesn't necessarily take a position on what the cost of this service is on the user end. Well. Uh, two points. First of all, you know we're we're providing you know capital to those institutions. Uh, it there uh, there is a subsidy element in that we're providing capital, presumably where others wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But the subsidy element is more in terms of the the type of risk we take and the term that we're providing. If a, if a university is building a new campus, it needs to fund that with long term money, and they typically have difficulty accessing that. Uh, so while we're providing that capital. Uh, we're charging essentially market interest rates for it. I mean, IFC earns a profit mm -hmm. every year, or almost every year. Um, and we feel that that's an important uh, metric that we, we're not subsidizing private investment, but we're actually providing an example that investing and financing these types of institutions can be a viable industry for other financial institutions as well. Um, and then on the you know, on whether we look at how those students are funded, we actually have, I would say, very few of our education investments are, are actual PPPs mm -hmm. with that model. Uh, most of them are, are purely private institutions and they operate in a mixed framework. Uh, some, you know, in some places like Brazil, there are public sector uh, uh, student lending and student funding programs that have contributed to the expansion of all types of universities. Uh, in others, it is uh, individuals paying their own way with typically some element of scholarship for some portion of the, of the students. Um, and in others, it's, uh, you know, it, it, there may be an infusion of public funding. We, we look at sort of all of those, um, but we don't, we're not necessarily uh, using that, you know, how the students are funded as a reason to invest or not. It, yeah. it really depends on, on each individual case. Yeah. Thanks. So, as I said at the outset, we didn't know Jishnu was going to be on this panel, so I had n no idea how coherently this might work out. But to, to keep playing up the contrast, I think, maybe between the IFC and the World Bank position, we have uh, this provocative blog title, uh, turning back to Jishnu again. This is from about a year ago. Um, on the Brookings blog, uh, and I'm going to ask you to explain what you mean here, Jishnu. Foreign aid should support private schooling, but not private schools. Um, explain to me what you mean by that distinction. I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fairly common distinction in, in, in that we use in policy, right? I mean, if you think about the solar panel industry, you probably want to put some kind of energy subsidies, but if you wanted to, uh, but you don't want to fund Solyndra, 
Right. I mean, and that's a point we've been making again and again. I suppose we know that. Ex ante, we were. <laughs> no, no, no. As a, as a matter of policy, you don't want to support a single school or a single chain of schools because you're putting the thumb on the scale in terms of your predictive, you know, either predicting that this school is going to do really well, which you don't know, right? Or at the worst, you're actually going to do well because you're creating a monopoly. Now, the biggest difference I find between education and, say, a venture capital in social media is that the venture capital in social media wants his or her firm that he's supposed to be supporting to become a monopoly, right? You actually want to crowd out other sources of funding. You want to make sure that they grab the entire market. But that's not the point of education. In education, you want the market to function better, right? So, so what I've been trying to argue for a while now is, look, you know, there is under no economic model, absolutely no economic model of competition, do we say that we should have a policy that supports a single school or a chain? We have tons of policies that say we should support decreasing constraints in the market so that the most innovative and efficient firms can do better. So, I mean, I think you're, I often describe Jiskin's position as one of the only people I know in the public-private partnership conversation who is hostile to public-private partnerships out of sympathy to the private, to the efficiency of the private sector. Um, usually the hostility comes from the other end of the spectrum. Uh, but so you've, you with your co-authors uh, working on this LEAPS project in Pakistan have kind of put together this framework of addressing market failures as the way to think about the public sector approaching the private sector. Um, and I want to go through a couple of the studies you've, you've worked on. One, if I have it here, these, you may not recognize them, but are your results. Um, uh, so one of the market failures I've heard you talk about, and I know you've written about, is information market failures. That if the public sector wanted to do something to improve the performance of the private sector, don't give them money, give people information. So how did you go about that and explain what we're looking at here? So this was... Uh... So we, we tested children in schools and we created school report cards and just gave these to parents. Uh, we have a paper that just came out on that which showed impacts over two years. Uh, we have been going back to these schools for eight years. Uh, so this is impacts after eight years uh, in these villages that were randomized and given information. Uh, for all children, it increased test scores by about 0.2 standard deviations. Uh, it increased private school test scores by 0.35 standard deviations. Uh, it increased public test scores by 0.12, and it lowered fees by about 600 rupees in the private sector, which is what a market failure is, right? A market failure is there's money on the, ta on, the, on the ground. I should be able to improve things by putting in less money. That's the only definition we have of a, of a market failure. This is eight years later, right? And I think this is one of the longest running evaluations we now have of very sustained... So the information treatment is ongoing for eight years? or no, it happened it, the went, beginning? it happened only for two years. That's it. Stop. Right? So the total cost divided over those eight years is about two cents per child, three cents per child. Right? Uh, so we're talking about massive gains to be had by decreasing constraints in the market that do not favor any one particular school over the other. And I mean, lead the horse to water here a little bit. What should I make of this differential in treatment effects between the public and private sector? Why is it that the private sector is more responsive to competition than the public sector? <laughs> okay, you're getting closer. <laughs> I'm closer to the water now. <laughs> uh, All right, you're going to stop there. Yeah, fair, the, fair enough. Apparently, uh, the private sector is more, uh, more, more responsive to competition than the, than the public what, you know, sector. Yeah. Quotable things I can use against you on the next round of this panel. No, but, absolutely. Um, okay, one more result. So unlike the others, Jishnu sent me 14 slides right before this. So I, um, Another approach to resolving market failures I've seen you folks write about um, is capital market failures. And if I understood the paper right, there are villages where you gave, let me make sure I get this right, one private school in the village a cash grant, and villages where you gave all the private schools in the village a cash grant. Is that right? Uh, how much are we talking? And what, explain these, these outcomes to us. So, so this follows from a conversation uh, I had with IFC about eight, ten years back, and they were asking, you know, what should we do? And I said, look, just go give some money to some schools. Don't pick them. Don't do anything. It'll probably help, right? Uh, but they wanted to invest in what they call a greenfield project, which is one school or one school chain 
Uh, so I just want to reiterate that I didn't know this when uh, planning this panel, but go on. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but our interest was, and they said, look, you have to put your money where your mouth is, right? Mm -hmm. So we took some donors' money and put our mouth there. Uh, and and we, would, we just wanted to put a benchmarking result on the table, right? I mean, the benchmarking result was very simple, which is, you know, suppose you just give cash to private schools. Don't differentiate. Make no assumptions about how you want to pick, right? Helicopter drop the cash, right? Uh, don't do anything else. Don't monitor what they do with the money. Don't pick the schools. Don't have any requirements on what they're supposed to do with the money. Definitely don't ask them to improve their test scores. What are you going to get, right? Uh, just So we did two kinds of experiments. One is we go into a village, we pick one private school randomly and give them the cash. And another experiment, we give all the private schools cash in the village. Our IRRs are about 140%, right? So it's, it's, explain it's, what the IRR means in this context. Who's so, getting the return on what? Okay, it's so, your money that went in, and who gets the money so out? So the fifty thousand rupees we give to a randomly selected private school in a village, they make up that money plus three times more within a year. Right. Okay, so you. Uh, this is the left hand so side. So we right? give in a one rupee, right? Parents crowd in another four rupees. Where is that coming from? Additional enrollment in the school, right? So this is exactly you know, your idea about uh, you want to increase enrollments, right? That's how you're going to get money. There are only two ways private schools are going to get money. They're going to get more children in or they're going to charge higher fees. Those are the only two ways it's going to work, right? So the first result was, you know, we've given you now a benchmark. If you want to make money in the private sector and help children, just please randomly drop money into schools. If you can beat our IRR of 150%, so that's your lower benchmark. Right? It's saying any selection you do on what schools to give money to, you should be getting IRRs above 150%. Right? This is what you get by random selection. And my worry in this industry has been, you know, I shouldn't use the Hans Rosling quote, right? <laughs> Probably not. Okay, <laughs> I don't know, but it... okay. I'm Karthik. No. No, no. My worry in this in this in this industry is the following, which is when we started looking at IRRs across different investments that people mm -hmm. are making in private schools, they're systematically getting less than 20%. Right? So that starts telling you there's some serious bias in the way people are investing in private school, which gives them IRRs of 20% compared to what you get by randomly investing, which is 140%, right? In defense of the private sector and the existing equity markets, though, you never got your money back, right? We are getting our money back because we expanded it to a loan treatment. Uh, we have now distributed about 25 million rupees in loans. We have had one default so far. Uh, the loan interest rates are running at between 20 and 40%, depending on the collateral. We don't select schools. Whoever wants to is happy to apply. Uh, so, yeah, we are getting our money back. I mean, so so... Then the second question was, well, you know, does this improve children's educational outcomes? It increases it for the additional kids that these, that these schools enroll. Uh, but the interesting thing is if you give money to all the schools, then you start getting pretty large increases in test scores as well, right? So they start competing with each other. They just can't just increase enrollment because the other schools have money as well. Uh, we show fairly carefully why you would expect that in these kinds of setups. Uh, and what you get there is a much lower IRR, about you know 35 to 40 percent. So it's still you know way above what the market rates are, uh, but you get fairly large increases in test scores of about 0 0.2 standard deviations, right? So you've got this choice. You could say, look, you know I'm interested in making money or or helping the private sector make money or make money ourselves. In which case your low benchmark is about 140 percent. You're going to help about you know just in terms of numbers, it helped about say. 30,000, 40, 50,000 kids in these villages. But alternatively, you say, look, we have an education social goal as well, in which case your IRR goes down to about 40%, and you get these large increases in, in test scores uh, as a result. But, you know, those are interesting benchmarking results to kind of think about uh, if you're trying anything else in this context. I think we may measure IRRs differently. In yeah, ISC, please, talk, uh, talk to us about IRRs. Well, um, but I, I think there's a... There's a difference between um, uh, you know, just sort of injecting some, some money into a school and uh, kind of funding an investment program. Um, I think that uh, if you look at you know, what, what typically what private schools need to expand, it's either to uh, adapt new curriculum, expand their, their offerings, 
or to build physical facilities. Uh, those, are, those are big upfront costs for them. Um, I think if it, that's, I think that's a different model than kind of just spraying some some money into schools that are operating on a very thin um, uh, financial margins, mm -hmm. uh, and then just sort of seeing what they do with it based on on competition. Um, so I, I think we're we're kind of operating at at, at diff different ends of the spectrum uh, in, in yep. terms of that. But I, I think it's I'd love to be able to try to convince our uh, credit committee that we should just be randomly investing money <laughs> in a bunch of small <laughs> informal schools. Only if you want to do better. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you, gotta, you can help me make so, that argument. Yeah, so let me come back to what you are doing with your money. So this is uh, um, slightly tongue in cheek. I don't know if my colleague Charles is in the room, but uh, there he is. So a recent blog post here on the CGD website. Um, please, uh, and in this case IFC, can you help me understand Ida's new private sector window? So IDA, for the non-World Bankers in the room, is the kind of concessional lending to governments that the World Bank government does. And as of IDA 18, correct me, Jim, if I get anything wrong, there will be $2.5 billion of IDA money set aside for lending to the private sector instead. And IFC is manager, custodian, whatever the right term is, of that money. So talk to us a bit about... I mean, this is somewhat provocative, right? This should... I would expect this is somewhat controversial in the development space. Money that's previously reserved for the low-income countries of the world is going to go into private sector investments. How is that going to work, and how might that work in an education context? Well, it's it's still going to go into those low-income countries. Uh, it's going to go into instead of public sector investments, it's going to go into private sector investments, um, and with a main focus on fragile and low-income IDA. So not just all of IDA, but the, the lower income end of the IDA spectrum. Um, we've, we've been under uh, lots of pressure from our board and other stakeholders to do more in the, sort of the most difficult situations, in the fragile states and, and low-income countries. We're the most difficult in terms of private, getting meaningful private investment. Um, and so we've argued that in order to to do that, we need some more tools in the toolkit. Using IFC's standard quasi-commercial investment um, approach, uh, expecting to earn a positive return on each investment, managing that portfolio, gets us only so far in those markets. If we want to do more, we need to be able to have some mechanism to take on more risk, to do projects that aren't fully as credit worthy, but have some promise or have some uh, especially strong development impact that makes us think they're worthwhile investing in. So the IDA private sector window gives us that additional toolkit. It's money that's invested alongside IFC in the same project, but on different terms to absorb, uh, to sort of de-risk some of those investments that uh, we hope will allow us to make the kinds of investments we've been um, unable to, to do so far and, and therefore expand the portfolio and expand the, the impact that we can have. Um, we see the potential for um, doing a number of education investments in that using those funds um, in terms of being able to, to take on riskier institutions that maybe aren't as well developed uh, uh, as our typical education clients are. Um, and. Uh, where we can do uh, the types of financing structures that will be much easier for them uh, to repay as well. So we are, it, it is, we, we bring that money in at concessional rates um, and use it for, for a whole different uh, range of projects and types of investments and types of companies and, and institutions. So to keep pressing you on the picking winners thing, yeah. And with the two kind of functions, this, you know, especially since this is IDA money now flowing through the IFC, I mean, we could hypothetically be in a world where IDA is lending to a country for education. Uh, maybe it's tertiary education, provides scholarships and loans. And IFC is using this private sector window to use the same IDA pot of money to back some of the companies who are bidding for that same money. So you could have a you could have public funds flowing through the Ministry of Education, 
following the student and private funds investing in a firm who's looking for government contracts in a PPP, is there some sort of, I guess what I'm getting at, this is maybe World Bank Governance 101, is there some sort of kind of firewall or separation of activities there between how your investees in the education sector behave versus how the, the bank supports education policy in one of these countries? I'm not sure that that would be, in the example you gave, that that would be necessarily a conflict. Mm -hmm. So uh, we support concessionaires on PPP projects um, quite routinely, not so much in the education sector, but in, in other sectors, in infrastructure in particular. Um, and if we're able to, to do so in a manner that brings in some concessional finance uh, to enable a project that otherwise would be marginal to go ahead, uh, or, a, or some type of uh, PPP to go ahead, then um, I think that uh, you know, is probably a worthwhile thing and would be welcomed by the, by the World Bank side. If I may, I mean, in, in the hypothetical I'm talking about, though, if, if your investee is bidding for in a public procurement situation and that public money is also bank money, the, the bank sits okay, on both in, sides yeah, of the no, table, in, right? In that situation, we would either make the same funding offer to all potential bidders mm -hmm. or we would only make an investment decision after they've won the, the, the concession. So we wouldn't try to favor parties in a bidding, in a bidding process. That certainly we wouldn't do. That's helpful. Um, OK, uh, let me, I've left Susanna out of the conversation here for a bit. Let me come back to the document that, uh, that you mentioned and maybe pivot back kind of more to what we started off talking about in terms of public-private partnerships was programs <laughs> that use public money to kind of make things cheaper from the point of view of the user or give free access to um, to privately operated schools. As you mentioned, ARC has just commissioned this uh, rigorous review of the evidence, um, uh, public-private partnerships in education in developing countries. Tell us, I mean, you hinted a minute ago that you found nothing, but I'm sure that 150 pages must be filled with more than, um, more than nothing. So tell us a bit about what you did and what you, what you mm -hmm. found through this review. So because we do this work with governments in developing countries, we um, and because it's quite controversial and because public funding is limited and strained and needs to be invested in the right way, um, we as an organisation want to sort of contribute to building up the evidence base on this as much as we can. Um, we don't want to keep doing it if it doesn't work. Um, so we wanted to look at the evidence that had been produced on public-private partnerships um, since the Harry Petrinos review, which was about um, eight or nine years ago now. This was partly to update that and partly to try to look at it with a slightly different lens. Um, and so I think the Manaz Aslam did the review um, and she found around 22 studies only um, that sort of met the rigorous criteria that that we'd agreed on. Um, and I think that in itself sort of tells you the limited evidence base there is on this topic. Um, and so she looked at sort of three different types of PPP. She looked at contract schools, or charter school equivalents, vouchers and subsidies. Um, and I think across all three, um, the review does conclude that the evidence base is limited. So we just don't have enough to make firm conclusions across any of those three thematic areas. Um, so the sort of number one takeaway is to do more research, get back into the field and collect more data. Um, Give just new more money, right? Um, I'll just pass them on to the schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think sort of secondly, where there was sort of weekly positive evidence, I think we have to be really clear this is sort of weekly positive improvements from a pretty low base. So we're talking about a learning crisis where kids aren't learning very much in public or private schools. So to actually get sort of, um, to overhype any results in this review, I think would be the wrong thing to do. Um, I think sort of thirdly, um, not being a researcher, I don't want to sort of talk about um, external validity, but it's difficult to make generalizable conclusions from most of these studies. So to say that something's worked in Chile and therefore it will work really well in Uganda or Ghana isn't really possible. So I think sort of looking going forward at more of a sort of theoretical framework that can cross context more effectively. Um, I think 
Fourth, there have been, these are often forgotten or underrated, there have been some really quite significant achievements in terms of access using the private sector. So the example I gave earlier of Uganda, where very few kids were transitioning to secondary school and the government of Uganda introduced the Uganda um, secondary education programme. That really has been successful in getting 450,000 more kids into secondary school. And similarly in the Philippines, the voucher program there, voucher program there is getting many, many more kids into senior high school. Um, and I think that's an incentive of government financing to get private operators to maybe go into places in the country they wouldn't go otherwise has been quite effective. Um, but, but really, sort of the main conclusion is that we, we have to be really careful about kind of um, overhyping PPPs as any sort of one single intervention to solve the learning crisis. And, you know, we get lots of requests from governments to support them on this kind of initiative. And we do think it's something that has potential. Um, but we need to make sure that we do continue to build up that evidence base much more rigorously. This can be nothing to go on if you're not going to make any stronger claims. I can't harass you about them. <laughs> I, I can fight about a couple of things. All right, go on, go on. <laughs> okay, so a couple of, couple of things. One is, so this idea that we know how to improve private schools, you know, increase curriculum or build, my, my point is, I don't know. I mean, I have no clue. I mean, these guys operate in very difficult circumstances. Each village is different, and people on the ground know much better than us. And I think this is something that's coming out from study after study that the prediction of experts is much worse than people on the on the ground, right? I mean, so the second thing is, do we give cash all the time, right? I mean, so if you look at the TNC, the trade and competitive practice in, in the World Bank, we give cash to firms all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So David McKinsey has this very nice paper on a program in Nigeria called You Win, where they just give this huge amount of cash. They distributed $50 million to Nigerian firms. And the way they did it was they said, you need to produce a business plan, and those guys who win above a certain score will get this money. Huge impacts on these firms. The part that he doesn't go into, but which is also fascinating, is the business plan itself has absolutely no correlation with whether you were doing better or not, right? I mean, so it's just a way of choosing schools, right? So that's our point, which is you can give just cash. I mean, there are ways we do it, right? I mean, DNC does it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think thinking very hard about what's the right way to alleviate capital constraints without uh, putting your thumb on the scale for particular schools or, or those things is a very, very worthwhile investment in, 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 my, in my regard. The, the second thing I wanted to pick up is, you know, I, I think if you put up that table that, that was there on, on the studies, mm -hmm. it's a little... It's not on studies, it's on programs. On, on programs. And your statement that there are a large number of children being supported by these vouchers, mm -hmm. right? So that's true, right? I mean, if you look at that third row, it's true that that many children are getting these vouchers, which is, of course, not what is the impact of these vouchers on enrollment, mm -hmm. right? So I think one thing that people miss a lot is that they think that the price elasticity of schooling in low-income countries is very high. It is not. Price is one of the lowest barriers to schooling in low-income countries. In South Africa, it's virtually zero. In Pakistan, it's minus 0.19, which means that a full voucher increases private school enrollments by about five percentage points. So, so in the US, here, let, 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 just to push you on that point, yeah. that the price elasticity so, of just schooling to, in South Africa so is zero. So that's 1.5 million in Pakistan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you look at, that is true, and it's all inframarginal kids. These are all kids who would have gone to private school with or without the voucher, mm -hmm. right? So what we have all done is given a huge amount of public money to children who were rich enough to go to private schools without the money. But that's certainly not the case across the board. Absolutely. And, and I mean, yeah, I think but I think we need to be careful with using those numbers as, as saying these are, you know, these are public money going into richer households. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the risk. Uh, I think that's sort of. But if you take again the Uganda example, where the private sector was incentivized by the government to go to areas where there weren't secondary schools, mm, sure. and actually yeah. where kids aren't don't have any choice, yeah. they have no choice at all. Um, I think that's where sort of some of the access PPP potential is 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 higher. Okay, um, we've dominated the conversation so far. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to start looking at my phone, because I promised I would respond to people on Twitter as well. Um, but I want to open it up. Uh, you guys still have to, still in the hot seat, but other people get to fire questions at you. Um, I want to take a round of questions, and Dev is there with a the mic. Miriam has mics. 
So um, we've got one here on the front row. Let's take a round. So Miriam, can we come up here to the front front row? Yep. Please. Uh, can you state your name, and then we'll we'll gather a few. So, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you. My name is Henan. Uh, I'm from Brazil, but I have been living in the U.S. in the past five years. And my question is related to both what you, the three of you guys said this, but also what you said about Brazilian public funds going into tertiary education, and what do you complement like in the end in terms of the risk of financing something that's going to end up like in richer households. So when you get like public funds that enable people to go to universities, as happened in Brazil, it, it is indeed really good in the short term, but there is a risk in terms of if this is good or not in the long term. When you have like a system in which like public, the best schools are public, and who attend the best schools are richer people, how do we fix this in a longer term by not creating something that seems to be a good strategy, but it's just reinforcing a very, a very big trouble that we have in the country in terms of having public fund not going straight to those who really need. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there was a woman on the front row, black and white jacket. Yes. Hi, Tracy Beth. Thanks again to everybody over here. I had a question, actually. I think it's for you, Justin. You asked Jishnu about our parents moving with their feet. And I guess more, I really wonder, is that the case, or is it that they have no other choice, and that's how you get that big expansion? So uh, I don't know, just new or, or, mm -hmm. or you, Justin. So again, did you see public enrollment decline? Um, and then if that's the case, then what are you doing with the um, kind of extra capacity in, in public schools when you've when moved everybody to uh, private? Thanks. Right, and the gentleman in the tan jacket. Yes, <laughs> Professor. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Steve Cleese, the University of Maryland. Um, I know the Center for Global Development prides itself on being nonpartisan mm -hmm. and nonpolitical, but I was surprised that this panel is so one-sided on such a set of controversial issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, the vouchers are controversial, OFI private schools are controversial, and the IFC support of private education is very controversial. Uh, just on the other side, just on low-fee private schools, um, the achievement data is very much debated. I mean, you look at the work of people like Prachi Sirastava, or even the DFID review a couple of years ago, show after controlling for socioeconomic background, there's no difference between private and public schools, low-fee private schools in achievement. Um, and the low-fee private schools refer, are, are are not low fee for a lot of poor people. So it, it, it results in further stratification of the poor and it legitimizes fees for the poorest people in the world. When, and, and, uh, uh, when we have treaties and international conventions that say basic education should be free. I know public schools charge fees but much less and we're trying to make those illegitimate. So there's a lot of uh, opposition to low-fee private schools. And on the point on price elasticity of, of, uh, in South Africa, I don't know the studies, but I know that fees are keeping lots of students out, poor students out, of public schools that are charging fees in South Africa. OK, so let's take those three. And there were several statements and maybe some questions buried in there uh, from Professor Cleese in the last one. Uh, I'm going to try to, well, anybody who wants to come in, but maybe the first one I think was directed uh, at you, Jim, about Brazil and investment in the private universities kind of reinforcing inequality in a sense. And I think that mirrors a concern uh, in the last question as well. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right in that I think you have the, the Elites, uh, academic universities in Brazil are all public institutions. I think that the students that enroll there and get accepted there are predominantly from better off families. What we've seen is that the expansion in the private sector provision um, w has been largely uh, oriented towards a different audience, towards a middle income, 
uh, population segment um, who typically pay the tuitions or their family pay or they borrow money to do it through some of the student lending programs. And those universities are much more oriented directly towards careers. They're, they have programs in, in IT, in nursing, in other, other fields, technical fields that are sort of directly related to job prospects and skills demands in the economy. So I think that that development in tertiary education um, and enrollments have gone from around 2 million in, in 2000 to almost between 7.5 and, and 8 million now um, in, in 2015 because of that expansion on the private sector side. So it still hasn't addressed that, that fundamental sort of inequality in the public universities, but the private universities have expanded access. They've been more efficient at what they do. So you see average tuition levels also during that period in the private sector declining for the same product because of that expansion of scale, private sector management, um, and frankly, competition among the, the different universities. Um, I think ultimately the answer is probably following something Jishnu would say, which is that the state should support, uh, you know, they should fund or partially fund schooling and not the educational institutions themselves in terms of how the public money gets used. So what would you, just shifting a little bit more to Steve's question at the end, someone who says we have international treaties, basic education, we've agreed politically in many countries should be free. IFC is investing in companies that are charging fees and making a profit off of charging fees. What's your response? I think that the, the private years sector, particularly the low-cost private schools, have emerged because of a failure on the public sector side. I think that parents know there's, there's not a big information asymmetry there. I think parents know or they learn from other parents who've sent their kids to those schools what their experience has been. Uh, and they're willing to pay for a differential in quality. And I think that's really what's, what's happened. It's been a, a failure on the public side. I think if that hadn't happened, nobody would be paying for that differential. I'm sure we'll have more on that point, but I want to give just you a, a chance. I think there were two things kind of that uh, I'm going to not try to answer on your behalf on as to whether parents are voting with their feet or are they just, do they just have no other choice and the private sector enrollment growth in Pakistan is just filling a void where there's no government provision. Um, and then the second part was about, you know, questioning the data. Is this True, can we trust the learning outcomes data we're seeing comparing public and private schools? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think parents are voting with their feet, uh, particularly, you know, you can do this pretty complex demand kind of modeling, and it essentially turns out that a lot of what parents vote on is distance, not prices. Uh, the work on South Africa is from Rob Garlick, and he shows very, very carefully that the user fee reduction in South Africa had zero impact on enrollment, zero. So we need to re you know, uh, re-examine the evidence with what the latest uh, uh, high quality studies look like. And it's been a surprise, right? I mean, the price elasticities are not that high. They just aren't. So when it comes down to, you know, do we believe these test score data? Well, the ones I've collected, I believe. Uh, the ones that are being published, well, you know, I kind of tend to believe what, what what's happening there. Will different studies find different things? Absolutely, because there's enormous heterogeneity in this sector. Right? So if you think about you know, the distribution of public schools, it's like the distribution of public schools in the US. You can go from zero to four standard deviations. And if you look at the distribution of private schools, they'll go from you know, one to five standard deviations. Right? So if I move a child, I can always do experiments where I move a child from a high performing to a low performing private school and I'll get a drop in performance. Or I can move a child from a low performing to a high perform low performing public to a high performing private school and get massive increases in evidence. The question is, what can we say about the overall distribution? That's one question, right? You can ask other questions about which parts of the distributions do you want to think about, uh, and you can start to get different different issues. But I think it'll be in general we'd be super careful about. You know, how is the sampling done? How is other stuff being done here? Because there is just massive heterogeneity uh, across schools in both the public and private sector, which actually dwarfs all the difference between public and private sector that we see in these, in these cases. I mean, I want to 
push Susanna on that, on the South Africa question. I mean, there is huge heterogeneity. I know you're working on this program in South Africa in public schools. Um, it's one thing to say the price elasticity is zero in the range in which it was measured when, uh -huh. when your user fees went down. Um, and the quality, yeah. Is that true across the board? There do seem to be, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Susanna, elite public schools in South mm -hmm. Africa where price is a real rationing mechanism, no? Right, so the South Africa system seems to me to be sort of structured to favor the advantaged, um, where so the quintile one to three schools, which are the poorest schools, get the government subsidy plus a sort of very small compensation for being quintile one to three schools from the government, very small. Whereas the richer schools, quintile four and five schools, parents essentially pay fees. They're not quite called fees, but that's what they are. And these can be sort of on the same level as UK private school fees, so extremely high. Um, and some of these government schools in South Africa are sort of, you know, rugby pitches and that sort of thing, really sort of like English public schools. Um, and I think so therefore they clearly are excluding poorer kids by the fact that the fees are far too high for those parents to pay. Um, they're also excluding poorer kids because they do select into them. Um, and so I think there are just some um, sort of real issues that actually stop poorer kids in South Africa from accessing better schools and having to therefore sort of pay to go to private schools as they think that their government schools aren't delivering them a good quality education. Okay. Um... Let's do another round here, keep things moving. I've seen a hand patiently waiting here in the second row. Uh, Dev, if you can come around, woman in the black in the second row. The hand is attached to a body, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, I recognize that tests um, can be tilted in certain ways. I wonder what other indicators you found <clears throat> about quality in the private schools. Any kind of interesting innovation, any kind of measures of creativity, interesting projects the kids are doing because of stimulating teachers. I'd, I'd like something other than test scores because we do have teaching to the test. I don't know what that's like in Pakistan, but it's not uh, ignored in other parts of the world, as you know. Okay, good. Um, and there was a gentleman in the sport coat. There we go. Um, hi, uh, my name is Hadi, um, and I have been working um, in Pakistan with the Sindh Education Foundation, uh, providing uh, sort of education service delivery under the PPP mode. Um, so I, I was just thinking about what to sort of uh, sort of what organize my thoughts and what to say. I think I have one request, one comment, and one question. Um, brief <laughs> on each, please. Yes, <laughs> brief one on each. So uh, the request is uh, pertaining to the province of Sindh. In, in uh, Pakistan, we usually uh, sort of quote often and discuss uh, Punjab and the voucher program over there. Whereas in Sindh, we have a subsidy program under the Sindh Education Foundation uh, that uh, has been you know, uh, in place for a long time. And 250,000 students are under this program. So um, it would be very nice to see sort of conversation on, on the, the, that program. One of, that, one of the programs within that is also a bank-funded program on promoting private schools in rural Sindh. So, um, and that particular program uh, has yielded a lot of results. Um, and uh, that sort of brings me to, to, the, to the comment, which is that uh, so the schools that we sort of constructed uh, with the private uh, uh, sector, uh, they were in extreme remote areas. Yeah. And therefore, uh, so this, this whole thing about whether um, you know, uh, the, the choice doesn't matter, um, uh, parents would pay anyway, I think does not apply to the Sin province, uh, of which, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there are about four to five, still four to six million uh, out of school children. So there's a huge potential uh, for PPPs to sort of uh, scale up over there as well uh, in, the, uh, in the context where you know, there's no choice uh, but uh, these uh, PPP ventures. And um, uh, the other thing regarding um, uh, also Pakistan is that uh, we have foundations uh, doing a lot of good work uh, in Pakistan, and uh, I think I'd like to name one, Citizens Foundation. And uh, they are at the stage where they're scaled up enough uh, that they, they have uh, um, reached sort of their limit now. They can't expand more except for without um, uh, government subsidies or grants uh, to other uh, entities. So in that case, would it not be uh, good that uh, uh, schools are funded, and not just schooling is funded through PPPs, uh, because these schools have these in, these uh, in school institutions have demonstrated quality as well. Okay, uh, and one more to close out the round, please. Uh, 
I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent are you able to use the internet to get together the local funding and to get the consensus among the people in the area what they want with their schools? Hmm. All right, so starting off with teaching to the test, does anybody want to comment on non-test score dimensions of private school quality? I mean, I would hazard, I mean, maybe this is for Jishnu, I guess that probably on non-test score dimensions, on many measures of quality as inputs, these private schools are going to look very bad. Am I wrong? Mm. Resources, staffing, None qualifications. None of student-teacher ratios. The student-teacher ratios are a lot small, a lot smaller. What is better? Smaller? <laughs> My English is getting tired. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> huh? Fewer students. Fewer students per teacher. Right. Yeah. right? I, got that. I got that. Uh, but you're right. Look, I don't think these guys are teaching to the test because they're not generally tested at that at that level. But I don't think we have invested sufficiently in understanding how children learn or don't learn in low-income countries. I mean, I think there's an enormous amount of work to be done there. Um, you know, we haven't even investigated simple things like how large is summer learning loss in these contexts, right? So I think there's a massive agenda uh, to think about. So appreciate that comment fully. Yeah. And would the IFC like to offer school as opposed to schooling funding to the Citizens Foundation? Or is just you, <laughs> or, the, or the bank and the IFC? <laughs> um, I think that's, a, that's certainly a, a possibility because I think that you know, even when you have uh, public money or grant money coming in on the, to fund the demand side, the supply side still has expenses that they need to do in order to, to gear up to, to provide the services and to and to put in place the facilities and the materials. So um, I think the issue for us as IFC has been, you know, we're a big international development bank and it's how do we get that type of supply side funding down to the small scale and, and small quantities that the, the low income schools need. And that's what was attractive about uh, Bridge as a model because it was, it does achieve scale and, uh, and these, these sort of an entity into which you know we were able to invest. This, so, so, uh, so I that troubles me because it's saying we won't invest in you until you become too big to fail, right? Which is no, so, I, so, I, so I, just I agree. To, I think th th know, this is a failing of, of IFC. Yeah. Is it? Like, yeah no, so, so we're so you know they're like since is very interesting, right? Because they had this foundation assisted schools that went to all kinds of local entrepreneurs and it produced fantastic results, right? I mean the results I've seen. There's a very nice paper by Dushyan Raju at the World Bank with uh, Felipe Barrera showing fairly large increases in enrollment. Coming to your point, or maybe if you were to set these up in remote areas where nobody else are, is around, can you get mm -hmm. some action moving from there? But then with TCF, remember, TCF is running at 75% losses, right? They need constant injections of cash from outside, right? So I'm a big fan of TCF, and we've had discussions with them multiple times saying you're doing two things. You're providing schooling, but you're also providing new models. Separate the two and allow your model to be sold as a different product to 10,000 schools around Pakistan. You're running, TCF is running 130 schools. You know, they're 0.1% of the enrollment of Pakistan or one, you know, something like that. They are not too big to fail, right? There is no reason to invest in something which is making losses persistently because they're, you know, because they're connected or because they're well known or because they're doing something different, right? Uh, and I think that's something that we really need to think hard about. So there's a big difference between the FAS program which I love, and the, the investment in TCF as a single chain, right? Right. I want to push on this point a little bit more because we're, we're coming to a close here. There's not much left between you and the drinks reception. Uh, but uh, if you'll permit us a little bit more, I feel we've had this distinction here in the conversation between funding schools, picking winners, funding schooling, trying to address market failures. Um, but we, we've got you know, other voices saying that I really think probably if we pulled the room right now, you know, I don't know how many people in the room are going to fully buy your price elasticity uh, is zero claim. We, we can believe you know, Bob Garlick's result for South Africa. 
But to say as a whole, you know, price is not a rationing mechanism in private schools around the world is a hard thing to swallow. Um, so the kinds of interventions we've been talking about of you know, information failures and capital grants investing in these school chains to improve their reach, how do we address the cost as a barrier to access to the quality schooling issue? Are we not, you know, do you have anything to say to that, to that crowd? But, but that's going to be the question of our generation, right? I mean, I think the, the liberal myth that we've all happily brought ourselves up on is if you equalize opportunities, everything will be fine. It doesn't work, right? And that's what we're waking up to. You know, you can take Zambia where 96% of, of uh, schools are public and the schools in Leopard Hill get a hell of a lot more money than the schools in a remote slum in, in, in Lusaka, right? Or you can take Montgomery County where I am, which is phenomenally diverse. It has two of US's uh, richest small towns and then it has North Montgomery County where 50% of the kids are on free and reduced meals. And frankly, the inequality is appalling, even though there is enormous stress on, on equalizing. So I think that is such a difficult question and it's something we'll have to grapple with very, very hard. It is the defining question of our generation. I mean, how are we going to get poor kids to do well? I don't think the, the private sector subsidy is a solution. And I think what we have discovered is that this idea that you know there, there can be equality of opportunity is also turned out to be a myth in the public sector. And I think you know that's a hard one. I mean, I don't I don't see what what simple answer we can give to that. I'm going to see if any of our other panelists want to end us on a more upbeat note. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I think there's a role for both. Uh, you know, public money funding the demand side and, and lowering the cost of uh, different types of school provision uh, in some structure that generates competition and innovation and experimentation. Um, and there's also a role for you know uh, more classic private investing on the on the private side into those institutions to allow them to grow and develop new new capacity, new technology. Uh, but the two are quite different. I mean, they're inter they, they interact, uh, but the, the two notions are quite uh, distinct. And, and, and one is, you know, one is a, a capital investment to fund an expansion. The other is an ongoing infusion of public funds into a system to drive down the cost. Susanna, final word? Mm -hmm. So I think the way we've come at this is not to say that one sector is better or worse than the other. I think, as I said before, there are sort of two quite pragmatic reasons to look at government engaging with, be that regulating or financing the private sector, the fact that so many kids are in private schools, and that's just a fact now, and the fact that kids across both sectors aren't learning enough. So, I mean, is there a role for the private sector, first of all, to try to improve access in areas where the public sector isn't currently delivering, and it would be too expensive for it to deliver? So I think in Uganda, it costs something like four times more to build and run a government secondary school than a private school. So I think there is, in Sindh, Uganda, a real potential for the private sector to make a difference there. And then secondly, on sort of the quality issue, if you believe that some combination of choice, autonomy, accountability does have the potential to raise standards, and if you believe that you know, there is potential for the private sector by being there to also help raise standards in government schools through those three things, I think there is reason to keep experimenting in this space. Um, I think it's keep experimenting while also rigorously evaluating because we just don't have enough evidence at the moment that PPPs or the private sector are something that any government should invest in um, as their only solution going forwards. I think you had just new support until you said only, but we were almost there. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's draw to a close there. We want to invite all of you to stick around, mingle and back. There are refreshments. And invite you back for the next two days of cutting edge research on improving systems of education starting at 9? Yeah. 9 AM tomorrow morning in this room. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you.